My second lecture today will be discussing tubular sclerosis complex. I have no disclosures. My objective is to describe TS, tubular sclerosis complex, discuss diagnosis, management, and treatment. That was supposed to be the second point there on the objectives. So tubular sclerosis complex, TS, what is TS? TS is a multi-system genetic disorder characterized by the formation of benign tumors called hemorrhotomas, which are non-cancerous, in various organs of the body, including brain, skin, kidney, heart, lungs, and eyes, just to mention. And these cause complications, um, including seizures, developmental delay, intellectual disabilities, skin abnormalities, and kidney problems. It's estimated that tuberculosis sclerosis affects one in 6,000 live births. Nearly one million people worldwide are estimated to have TS, approximately 50,000 in the U.S., and it shows no gender bias and occurs in all races. Genetic basis. So it's inherited in an autosomal dominant manner with complete penetrance. About a third of individuals diagnosed will have an affected parent. Two thirds as a result of a de novo pathogenic variant. The mutation, it's thought to be a mutation of the TSC1 or TSC2 gene, both thought to be involved in tumor suppression, um, encoding hemerton and tuberin respectively. Um, hemerton and the tuberin form a complex which is expressed widely in normal tissue through the mTOR pathway. If there's a dysregulation, which is what we're seeing in TS, this is going to lead to uncontrolled cell growth, proliferation, and having these non-cancerous growths in all different parts of the, the body. Okay. So as mentioned, this is um, a depiction. Let me. There we go. So t again, tuber and uh, hemerton bind to form a tumor suppressive complex mo molecule. The complex is a principal inhibitor of the mTOR, uh, which involved in the regulatory cell cycle progression. Okay. So if you're having a dysfunction here in the hemerton, this is the dysregulation. It's not allowing tumor suppression. So you're having an increase in protein synthesis, cell growth, all the hemerotomas. Um, from this area. And I'll come back to this at a later slide um, as I talk about management. Clinical manifestations, I've listed um, some major ones uh, that they see. And something I found interesting, you know, I focus on the neurology side of this. And when I was preparing this lecture, I started looking like at other journals. I started looking at the dermatology journals. I started looking at the kidney journals just to get a different outlook because you're always looking from your field. Um, and I wasn't aware until I was really preparing this of skin lesions are thought to be about 100% of uh, persons with features. And uh, the main one that um, I learned is the fibrous cephalic plaque, which I'll show you a picture in, in the later slides. And they, they quoted up to 90 to 100% of the patients with TS will have that. So I found that very interesting. Um, so skin lesions, you guys can read, um, but you know, hypomelodic macules are thought, facial angiofibromas, chagrin patches, and I have pictures of all of this in a later slide. Um, the CNS manifestations, which is predominantly what I'll be focusing on, um, are subependable nodules. You have cortical tubers, uh, SEGAs, so astrocytomas. Um, and then there's an umbrella of behavioral, cognitive, psychiatric components that are associated with this as well. And then kidney lesions, um, benign renal angiomyolipomas, um, some cysts, some renal cell carcinoma, less than 3%. And then the cardiac rhabdomyomas, uh, lymphangioleomyomatosis, or LAMS, okay, um, and retinal lesions. So these are all common findings or clinical manifestations in this disease and disorder. Diagnosis. Um, I've listed the clinical criteria for the diagnosis of tuberous sclerosis complex. Definite TSC is two major features or one major feature and two minor features. Um, they did update the criteria, and there wasn't that much updating. Um, they did change where it says cortical dysplasias. They kind of made it more general. It was cortical tubers originally, and then confetti skin lesions were um, modified for the more updated uh, guidelines. 
And then genetic testing is very important, um, provides a de definite diagnosis, but you can have a mosaicism. Um, we started a neurocutaneous clinic um, at Joe DiMaggio, and at least in the US, if, I, if I'm showing, even if it's not genetic positive, if I'm showing clinical features, mosaicism, I'm able to get um, some of the approvals for the medicines I'll discuss. Um, and imaging, of course, for MRI for the brain lesions and ultrasound for any renal uh, involvement is crucial and helpful for diagnosis as well. So I have a couple of pictures now, because pictures are worth a million words. Uh, this is a depiction of the hypopigmented macules. Okay, You can have these and not have TS, uh, but these are one of the diagnoses. Here's some of the angiofibromas and the fibrocephalic plaque that I was mentioning. That's got one of the highest features in the dermatology world. Okay. And all of these are, again, little non-cancerous growths that are just growing on all different parts of the, the body. Here's some ungual fibromas. Okay. Oof. Chagrin patch. This is a, another classic dermatology finding. Looks different on different skin tones. Um, it's important, because I know we've turned so much into genetic basis and all this testing. Um, clinical manifestation, it's one of the beauties in our specialty, right? Neurology still needs that physical exam. And um, wood lamp for dermatology, it's really important, especially if you're trying to catch some of these lesions um, on a very fair skin. The wood's lamp is old school, but it's still very helpful. Um, you can find some oral lesions, so these patients should be seeing a dentist. I think sometimes that's uh, forgotten, but that is something um, that's pretty classic, intraoral fibromas and enamel pits, which are a little bit difficult to see, but you can see that over there. Uh, ophthalmic involvement, so you'll, you can have retinal hematomas, but they're seldom symptomatic. You can also have non-retinal lesions, including angiofibromas of the eyelid and strabismus. And there's a depiction of a retinal hematoma. Here's uh, some neurological findings. So this is a very busy slide, but this is a great slide because it shows quite a bit of the neurological findings. Okay, so. Right here, you're seeing those punctate hyperintensities. Those are white matter anomalies that are actually going towards the ventricle. So often these transmantle radiology signs, okay, they're often going towards the ventricle, and that's very helpful to see that it's a dysplasia. And if you could see over there, the atrium over there, these, these are subependymal nodules that are lining up on the ventricle over there. And here's one in the atrium, one in the lateral ventricle of subependymal nodules. Okay, here you have a big transmental dysplasia. And here's a little bit of a hyperintensity in the parietal region as well. And then here in the right foramen of Monroe, you see a SEGA, an astrocytoma. It's about less than 12 millimeters. And on that left area over there, in the atrium over there, you'll see subependymal nodules lining the ventricles. And here's a big dysplasia as well. This slide shows, and I thought this was a great sh slide to show how as you get older, the tuber is going to look different radiologically. So let me show you. So this is at 10 weeks of age. You can see the actual tuber itself is hypodense, but you see the hyperintensity of the rim around it. Here's a little subependual nodule as well. This is a CT at, the, at four months of age, showing you the difference of the calcification. Well, you can't see it on the MRI, but there's the calcification on that rim now. Here at eight months, this is the same lesion as this, but you can appreciate appreciate that they look different. Ooh, I'm having a hard time here. There. So they look different. This is 10 weeks versus 8 months. And then this is a T2 image. 
so you can see the different intensities within that whirling dysplasia. Okay, so as, as time goes by, you might see more, things look different, and that's why we really, really appreciate our radiology colleagues. And here's a neonate at two days. Um, you can see this is causing hydrocephalus, okay, the Sega, more on the left than the right. And then these little arrows are showing cysts in the frontal horns of the lateral ventricles. So this is where our neurosurgeons come into play and help us. Um, and that's why we get concerned with a lot of our lesions. So we want to make sure that we don't cause any hydrocephalus and increase in ICP. Here are the subependymal nodules that I mentioned that line the ventricles, and this is uh, from a path perspective or a gross path perspective, where they, they say it's typical melted candle wax is how they describe it, appearance on path. Okay, and here's just another depiction of the Sega, often requiring any surgical resection. Something I found interesting, symptomatic Sega, they quoted about 6 to 9% of kids with TS, not kids, 6 to 9% of people with TS will show up with symptomatic uh, SEGA. And that usually happens at the ages of 10 to 30. The youngest I saw was 1.5 years of age. And this is a very busy slide. Um, but I just wanted to reiterate the complications. And I'm going to focus more on the neurological side now um, with the seizures. Um, and the SEGAs. But uh, of course, going back to that neuropsychiatry umbrella, okay, there's development, psychiatry, behavior, neurology. It's important to use a multidisciplinary approach on a multidisciplinary disease, which is very important. It's probably one of the main visions why I started this neurocutaneous clinic at Joe DiMaggio, because it's really hard for these parents to go see five different specialists. So I, I, I my vision was to bring at least have access and bring the specialist to the clinic. And it's been really helpful for parents versus driving different appointments every week. Here are some of the cardiovascular complications. They do mention some endocrine complications, but it's not as often. It's less common. All right, so treatment options, um, anti-seizure medications, educational support is very important. Um, mTOR inhibitors, which is virolimus, sirolimus for tumor management, and surgical intervention. Um, indications for resection, you know, in epilepsy surgery world we know, even in pediatrics, if we can, the earlier resection, the better for plasticity of the child. Um, it's amazing. It's half the reason why I went into pediatrics. The compensation, the plasticity of a child is really incredible. If you, um, if you can, it's, it's difficult to sometimes find a hot nodule or a hot tuber. Um, but if you can and you do know that that's your area, that's your location, that's your onset, um, definitely go ahead and do the surgical workup, see if they're a candidate, um, and talk to your surgeon. All right. So this is a, a video of a baby. I just want to, if everyone can appreciate that, that quick hand, hand extension, I'm just going to go back. So clinical vignette here is a six-month-old kid who's doing really well nor, uh, developmentally and all of a sudden starts losing some milestones. Um, dad and mom bring them in. They're concerned. They're seeing all these events. They usually describe it as their hands extending out clusters in the morning, clusters at night. Um, they just look really uncomfortable, Doc. And then we put on an EEG, and we see a typical spasm right there, OK? And um, differential diagnosis on this is reflux. Uh, so make sure, you know, we want to make sure there's other differential diagnosis on this, too. But getting that history of development is so important in neurology, as we know, um, and the age range, I think, the earliest I've seen in diagnosis of infantile spasms and not modified hips, actually the, the EEG findings is four months. So even though textbooks say six months, we want to make sure we're thinking out of the box sometimes too. Or it's not classic textbook. 
life is not classic textbook. Um, infantile spasms, again, clinical spasms, one to two seconds, a subtle momentary flexion or extension of the body, and it cl occurs in gl clusters. You don't need a video EEG for this. You just need a short routine EEG to see what the background looks like. It's often chaotic, very disorganized, high amplitude, multifocal spikes. And then when they have one of those seizures, it almost looks like it almost looks normal, more normal than the background does. Um, but usually it's just attenuation of the background during the seizure. And the treatment first line is Vigadrone or Vigabitrin. If you have infantile spasms in the setting of TS, that's really important. Um, that's the only exception where ACTH and prednisone aren't the first line of therapy, uh, Vigadrone is. And that's a GABA analog inhibitor. Um, so that's important to. If you see a kid like this, you want to see what the etiology is because it will change your management if it's TS. And then overview of the virulimus. Uh, this is, again, one of the main initiatives for my clinic because I really feel strongly about virulimus. I've been using it on um, some of our children. Can't use it until the age of one, um, but it's really helped. Um, prognosis, it's helped slow down the, the, the process of the disease. Um, the mechanism of action of virulimus inhibits the mTOR pathway, reducing cell growth and proliferation. It was approved in 2010 for treatments for SEGA and angio, uh, renal angiomyelopomas. And I come back to this diagram because it's the virulimus. So the thought is, is you're inhibiting the mTOR pathway. So it's not allowing the cell growth, so it's slowing down the progress and helping from a seizure standpoint as well, which is beautiful. Or could. Doesn't. Okay. And then I'm just going to discuss th probably the th uh, three major studies um, of tuberous sclerosis looking at a virulimus. The first one was EXIST-1 trial. This one was to evaluate the safety and the efficacy of a virulimus in uh, patients with SEGAs. Uh, it, was a random, it was a randomized double-blinded study. It had 117 patients. And what they found was 35% of the patients in the virulimus group had at least a 50% reduction in the volume of the SEGAs versus placebo. And the p-value is pretty significant. So that was really, really helpful to, uh, a helpful study to help endorse a virulimus as management. The exec EXIST-2 trial, that one in particular looked at the renal angiolipomas, um, and they showed that the angiomyolipoma response rate was 42% for a virulimus versus 0%. Um, again, showing that it helped reduce the size, or at least, if not reducing the size, allowing it not to grow, right? Because that's, that's ultimately what we're trying to do, is slow down this progression. So that was EXIST-2 trial. And then the EXIST-3 actually looked at seizures. Um, and they had 366 patients enrolled. And what they found was they had low exposure virulimus and high exposure virulimus. And the response rate was 15.1% with placebo compared to 28.2% for low exposure virulimus and 40% for high exposure. So in overall, you know, it shows improvement and it shows um, not cessation, but slowing down of the disease process. Safety and side effect, you, got, you have to make sure um, you're looking for potentials, checking kidneys, you know, there's complications that can happen of renal impairment, uh, metabolic changes, and you want to make sure you're doing regular follow-ups and lab tests on all systems that are affected. Okay, and this just wrote pediatric dosing. Um, we look, I, I use up to date when, when I need to uh, clarify some things, and they have the levels or the serum troughs. Actually, up to date is really good. I have to say, I had one child that ended up with an oral ulcer, so I had to go back to see what to do. And up to date really explains a great job of you know you stop it, you recheck the levels. So it's a, it's a great resource, um, as well as PubMed. Obviously, we were all taught on PubMed, but I, I do I do use this a lot. And then long term management, multidisciplinary approach, importance of coordinated care team. Um, regular monitoring and patient education, self-advocacy, um, you know, making those registries uh, more up-to-date. Those are all really, really helpful things to do. Um, current studies are investigating genetic therapies. 
Again, mentioning the patient registries, emerging therapies are happening. I was talking to one of my colleagues um, who's in the neonatal world, and she was saying how there's studies going on on virulimus to give to the mom, if you know that in utero there is a child with TS, to see what those are. So those are all kind of in progress right now. So time will tell us. And I really do think virulimus, this mTOR inhibitor, um, has really affected and played such a beneficial role um, for these children. Conclusion is... We, it's a complex disorder requiring a comprehensive approach to diagnosis and management, and the importance of ongoing research and patient advocacy is crucial. Thank you, guys.